find a lot of MS guys out there with their bowies and different things, and absolutely there's a market out there for fixed blades. But 80% of the blades that are out there right now are three-piece fixed blades that they that they started on Fortune Fire, right? And that's the reality of today. And and so these guys are out there and they want to sell a knife and they're selling for a hundred bucks with a sheet. Yeah. Cool. And you're not making money. Right. Okay, now maybe this isn't a money thing for you, and that's great. It's not for me. I don't like selling my knives. I give them away, I've given away way more than I've ever sold, and, and I'll continue to do that. And I'll sell one every now and then when someone talks me out of it. But the reality is the competition in fixed blades is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And I got the numbers and data to back that up. Okay? Now that's not to say it's not fun, it's not great to do. And that there isn't uses, but you know, if you're going to get in fixed blades, look at kitchen knives. Mm -hmm. Okay, you got guys out there getting hundred dollars an inch for a kitchen knife. Okay, and then uh, if you otherwise, you know, when we get in our next war tomorrow, whenever, tactical, you know, you got all these military guys coming in, and they want it. That that's what they want to make. That's awesome. And they'll get 200 bucks, and if they make a nice Kydex sheath, they'll get 300. And that's the reality of knife making today. If you wanna, if you wanna get some, some more money, you make folders, and you keep getting better. The first ones are gonna, uh, guaranteed gonna be crap. Guaranteed gonna be bad, okay? Just the way it is. You know, and, and when you made your first fixed blade, you didn't feel that way. You just thought, man, I'm fired up. I'm gonna make my next one that's gonna be better. But what I see with folder guys is they make their first one, they say, this is too hard, and they walk away. And all those folder guys, you talk to any of them that doing this full time, been in the business for a while, they all started with the drill press and, and a flat piece, and they hand sand it. And so, you know, I hear, well, I don't have the tools. I don't have a mill. I don't have this. And that's, that's crap. You can make folders without that. You can just get you a good drill press. And, and I use Harbor Freight drill presses up until... I got that new blue machine right there, and that was just a few weeks ago. And, and that's the reality of it, okay? I like tools better than knives, <laughs> as you can tell, okay? Now, that's heresy, but that's, that's the reality. If I can get a new tool that makes something cool, that's what I want. So I'm going to spend a couple minutes going over some of the tools that I use and maybe you might be interested in. I'm not trying to sell you anything, but I will explain a few things. So one of the things that you should look into are stones. This is from Falco. You get a kit. They have an assortment kit. And stones come in different grits. And they come in different composite types. Some are more, some are more friable. They come apart easier. And, and some are harder, but they'll be the same grit. So you can, get, you can get literally four or five different types of stones at the exact same grit and they will behave differently in how they break down and, and expose sharp new material. Always use oil. Falco sells a sample kit of a bunch of different grits and a bunch of different types for about 60 bucks. And it's the absolute easiest way I've seen to get into using stones. Since I found out about Todd begg has been talking about these for years and I finally talked to him, I said, which ones are you using? And he says, I use the EDM type. Now, there's different types. They'll be labeled, uh, I said Falco, it's Falcon. There's EDM, which looks like brown. Then there's R, whatever the hell that is. Then there's uh, N, whatever that is. And then there'll be another one that says grinding oil stone, whatever that is. And a white one, whatever that is. And I just tend to grab whichever one. I scrape a couple times. And then if I don't like it, I grab the same grit in another type stone depending upon what I'm doing. You can shape, you can sculpt, uh, you can do all kinds of things. When I fix, when I make a lock face and, I've, and I'm not satisfied with it, I'll take a 600 grit or 800 grit stone and I'll stone the lock face smoother. I can change the shape and I can change the lock up manually on using a stone. And, it ta and you're not gonna go too far, believe me, because you're just scraping just that little bit like that, okay? But stones, if you haven't tried any, 60 bucks, it's a great deal, and, you, and I would look into them, okay? So they'll break, you can get the little handles, which I never use, but if, if you wanna try some, they'll, they'll sit right here, and you can play with them. 
when you get into folders, you're going to find that you use 10 drills, maybe, because you're going to standardize. And you're going to spend all your time looking for tools. A third of my day is looking for the damn tool that I either forgot where I set it down or someone else moved it. You know, your wife always moves stuff, right? That's how it works here. When you, if you're in your own shop, you got a better chance. But I'm not in my own shop. I got other people working here. And, uh, you know, if it's sitting out, it's kind of fair game. But uh, it, when you get organized and you start doing folders, I'd suggest you make a board like this and you put all of the exact drills that you want and you don't have to go through your drill cabinet it's got a place to go it's labeled and you have exactly what you want when you want it okay so that will that will save you hours of looking for for parts okay and then uh, as you get into it one of the things that you should look at is a spotting drill now this is a big one this is way oversized and I'll pass them around I tend to use the now there's different ones this is Typically used in a lathe. It's got a 60 degree angle on there so you can countersink and for a dead end or a live end on a lathe it will it will put that in. But these little things are stiff and you should start off your holes with something like one of these. Okay, after you punch, you tap it with this. Either a, now this one happens to be a carbide 90 degree and it's very tough and I'll use this to start my drill hole so it's straight after I after I center punch it. Or you can use one of these styles, and I'll pass them both around, and you can take a look at them. But those are those are worth your money. And and if you want straight holes, the biggest problem with folders, what I have found in the past, is that you got six holes maybe, and they got to line up perfectly between the two sides. Okay. And if your drill bit wanders a little bit on this one, and your drill bit wanders a little bit on this one, and then you go to drill, and then you go to 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 screw it all together, it will screw together, but it's going to be crooked every time, and it's going to be canned. And every time you put that thing together, it's going to have a different position. So it's really important that your holes line up dead nuts, and and that they're all drilled the same way. And you'll have a lot better chance if your liners are off or your frame locks are off. You're going to have you're going to fight that guaranteed. Okay, and every time you put it together, it's going to change the lock up on you. Guaranteed, it's just how it works, okay? So as you're going through and you're putting holes in, the process is, I'll show you this. This is from Grizzly Tool. It's called an optical punch, okay? So this has got a little piece of plastic in it, a couple holes, okay? You only need one hole. I don't know why there's two, but there is. You put this in and you put that over your part and you look down and you line up either the little dot or the little crosshair. There's two little versions of these. And you put that in, you go, okay, I got it. Then you pull that plastic out, you hold that in place. You take your little punch, and there's two versions of punches. There's a prick punch and a, and a regular punch. I use the prick one. Okay, you put that in that hole, tap it, and you've got your center punch. Okay, and that's way better than an automatic punch or a manual punch because you, you've got about 10 power magnification on this thing to see where it lines up. Now I'm gonna, I'll pass it around with the little plastic deal. This will fall out, so be careful. And you can see what that is. That's about 45 bucks from Grizzly Tool and it's worth every penny. You're gonna get a very exact, precise hole when you put that in and you'll mark it and you'll be able to. So my process is I'll hand draw a pattern I'll go to the CAD and I'll and I'll draw it up on computer and I'll put it on CAD. Then I'll super glue that I'll cut that paper out, I'll print it out to actual size. I'll super glue that pattern on. Then I'll take the optical, I'll line up exactly over the holes because on the CAD it'll give you a little cross here. And I can line that up exactly. I'll line that up, I'll tap that hole, then I'll step over and I'll use that center drill to get my hole started, and then I'll finish my drill hole. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, drilling a round hole is an art. If you've ever seen any of the, the form wars on drilling in the old man, it was awful. Most holes you drill are three lobes. They're, they're not round at all. They're three lobes. The bigger the drill bit, the more you'll see that. The duller your drill bit, the more you'll see that. For you guys that hand sharpen a drill, you're getting bigger three lobe holes than you realize. 
Okay, I under, you know, it's a, it's a, it, people get really excited about, well, I can start my own. Great, but you're gonna not have round holes, okay? You can't tell me that a brand new drill bit that costs you a buck and a half is not gonna work better than the one you hand sharpen. Now, I used a drill doctor for years until I figured out my drill bits were wandering. And that's just the way it is. So drills are consumable. You don't run them until they stop drilling and heat everything up, just like a belt. The, the cheapest belt you can use is a brand new one, believe me. You'll save, you, you'll save yourself some hassle. So when, so when you're drilling your pivot hole, let's just talk about a 316. <clears throat> when you drill your pivot hole, I'm gonna optical punch it, okay? Then I'm gonna drill it undersized. I'm gonna use a number 15 drill, which is about 180 thou. 316 is 1875, okay? Then I'm gonna ream that uh, and my re this is I've got my reamer set up right here. So I have a number for my 316. I have a number 15 drill, brand new one because I want a nice straight hole. Then I'll follow up with a carbide reamer. Now there's all kinds of different reamers. There's carbide. There's high speed. There's twist. There's flute. There's helical. I tend to just use these short ones, and you can get longer chucking reamers. A chucking reamer is meant to be that long. And as you're drilling manually, they're supposed, the theory is they bend enough and they straighten out where it'll take out, where your hole will be more perpendicular, it'll be more plumb. I haven't found that to be the case because we're drilling real thin material generally, 100 thou at the thickest often for this kind of thing. And so uh, I use a straight one, but you always drill undersized. And you drill undersized by 5 to 15 thou, okay? So if you're drilling a 1 8 hole, you're going to drill with about a 120 drill bit to 115. 115 to 120, and then you're going to ream that hole out. Now, in theory, you've got a, a perfectly sized hole. Reamers wear out. The only part on a, on a reamer on this style and most styles that cuts is that little 45-degree chamfer right there. Okay, that's the only cutting part on that reamer. And when you're checking and you, and you see the sides are sharp, you think, man, that cuts all the way down. It doesn't, okay? The sides don't cut. They never were made that way. They're not even sharp enough to cut. The only part that cuts is the 45 degree chamfer on the end. So when you're inspecting your tool for wear, look at that little 45 edge chamfer, and that's where you're gonna see if it's, if it's cutting or not. I always use carbide because high speed steel wears out. I do most of my drilling and and that titanium, it eats high speed. So, uh, so you're gonna ream to that. Now, now you got a 316 hole, right? So now you're gonna put your pivot in there and your pivot won't fit. Why is that? Because it's a 316 hole and you got a 316 pivot. You can't expect a, a, the same size rod to go in the same size hole because they're the same damn size. And that's the way it is. So. Uh, and it, what I used to do is, is take and chuck up a little uh, uh, pivot and I'd chuck it up in my drill and I would go over to the grinder and or figure out how to knock a little bit off the outside diameter of the pivot and you get a nice football shaped pivot that ain't worth a shit. <laughs> and I got one right here. I pulled out of my drawer, I'll pass this around, but you can see it's a nice oblong and you'll get it to fit in the hole. The problem is your tolerance has gone to hell. Okay, you want that to fit. So what you're gonna do, is something called a barrel lap and and this took a while to learn about um a barrel lap so so you've drilled it undersized you've reamed it you got a 316 hole but your pivot still doesn't fit in the hole right so it's sticky and and you also got tolerance on the inside you know and and so what you're going to do is this these made are made to expand this is one style but they're all kind of the same they expand, now this one has brass. Uh, it's outlined with brass, and what you're gonna do is dip it into lapping compound. Lapping compound, clover lapping compound, I'll give you some if you want some. Uh, this amount would last me the rest of my life. I hope I live a long time too. Okay, so what happens is this lapping compound gets embedded into the brass on this, and I'll pass it around so you can see it. And that lap and that abrasive will wear out, so you have to recharge your your uh, your reamer or your barrel lap a couple times when you're using it. It just wears out. It's just like a, an abrasive. So now, 
So when you're pushing that down into your hole, you're going to go slow. I started using 120. That was way too aggressive. So now I use 400 as a practice. And I go slow. And so this brass will wear out. The abrasive will wear out. And after a while, it just won't do anything in the hole. So these expand. And if you look at the end, and, I'm not, and it takes a piece of pliers, and you turn it about a third. And what happens is that's got a little screw in there, and it balloons out the, the brass leaves. Okay, and, and so that balloons out and then you're going to scrub that up and down the hole and you're going to make your hole round. You're going to polish the hole for a nice finish and you're going to get a lot rounder hole and it's going to fit. So drilling is, you know, that fast. Nothing to it. Lapping is a minute or two. Okay, these will break. If you force these, they're very, they're somewhat fragile. And they'll just they'll break right off, and the, you just be out of part. So what you want to do is you sneak up on it. You just give it a very slight turn, and and you lap. Give it, and if that's, and then test fit your part. You should be able to get within two tenths. What speed? Uh, I use the same as the drill speed. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and now that's a great. I, met, I forgot to mention that when you ream, you ream at half your speed of a drill. Okay. Y'all know there's recommended speeds for drills, right? <laughs> and then no one uses them. Just, just, just use 1,200 for everything, okay? All your drill presses are adjustable. Just set it at 1,200 and forget it, okay? You're going to be fine. But for reaming, you go half speed, okay? And then the other myth that's out there, when you're drilling a hole and you're using a carbide drill, Carbide is made to go twice as fast as high-speed steel. And you don't use cutting fluid or, or water or coolant because carbide shocks and cracks. And you get micro cracks and you wear out your carbide. Carbide's meant to run dry. And you run it at twice the speed. Okay? You just cured like six arguments in this one little section. That's the idea, man. I went to machine school for a couple years, so I did actually pick something up. Okay, so these, these, these barrel laps come in different kinds. I'm not trying to sell you one. Uh, there's other places that got them. We carry them in a few different sizes. And you, so you can get them in A, 316, quarter. I can tell you that about 80, 90% of the folders that are out there are 316 pivots. They're, they're just 316. You get really small ones, maybe an eighth. And then, you know, if you're going to build a, an overbuilt tank like some of the guys do, quarter inch blade and all that. They want the quarter inch just because it looks cool. Doesn't add any strength. You don't need to do that, but you can. It's a style. Okay. So now you got to countersink some holes in you, either your your liners or or what you know your frames or whatever. Screws are different. Okay. And and depending upon what screws you got, you measure the head with a you measure the heads of the screws. Now maybe you're using a button head. Maybe you're using a pan head. A socket cap, they're all different sizes. So when you're planning out your project, it's important to get ahead on your tools and understand what you're trying to do. Now, counter bores come in all different kinds. I have several custom made for us uh, that are solid one-piece carbide. I prefer those. You prefer whatever you want to prefer. But I have a bunch of these made because I wanted them for bearings. I wanted them for screws. I use different screw sizes. And then there's ANSI standards for the diameters on these screw heads. And the ANSI standard for a 256 button head screw is literally anywhere from 148 to 167 on the head diameter. So, so you got to know what you're getting into. If you buy an old fashioned counter bore for a number two screw, it's not going to fit a button head because it's made to fit a socket cap. And a socket cap standard, ANSI standard, is around a 140. Okay, so measure your screw heads, plan that part, plan your hardware out. It's not just the pieces that you're drilling in that, you gotta plan your hardware. Okay, so counter bores are gonna help you get, uh, and there's, there's uh, help you get countersink on your pivot heads or your screws. Now they'll all will have a pilot, okay? So there's this, in this case, it's a solid pilot. And then they'll have the cutting diameter and the shank diameter may or may not match the cutter, okay? So that's carbide. Now there's three piece or two piece uh, uh, counter bores. Now here's the rub. This part really sucks. Okay, so you, 
So what you got to do is, is you find the cutting diameter that you want. Okay, and this is all MSC. I carry a few, but you just can't carry them all. And then you got to find the pilot diameter because this pilot removes. And so they'll look like this. These little pilots will lit in there. And so you got to match the diameter of the, of the hole that you're in. Then you got to match the cutter. And then to, add, to make it worse, there's different size shanks. So you got three measurements to keep up with. It, it's a pain. Now the advantage to these, these two part ones is in theory that you can just get different pilot sizes. So maybe you got a 440 screw that you want to pilot out and you can change that. Now this one uh, was a smaller, I just used a piece of brass and then I found another piece of tubing and I put, I didn't have a pilot. So I just had to jam a piece of brass in there and then an, another bushing on top of it to get it to fit in the pilot hole. The whole idea behind a counter bore is that your pilot gets stuck in the hole and it doesn't wobble around and chatter and then you can just drive it down and sink that down as far as you want and it gives you a nice countersink with the flat bottom okay countersinks matter and they're expensive this one probably is 70 bucks they're expensive so plan your tools man because you're going to spend a fortune and uh, you know if you if you're going to experiment with different sizes and different things, and you should, I think. Um, you're going to end up with a collection, huh? How long does that cutter last? A carbide one will, uh, I, hundreds of holes. A high speed steel one in titanium, 30, 40 before it starts to drag. And, and instead of cutting, it shreds. Yeah, it, it's, just, it's just not pleasant. You know, you want something that cuts. You want to feel good about how it cuts. Um, but the carbide ones last a long time, and a lot of folders are, are uh, titanium. Now, there's the slippy guys and, and that, the traditional guys that are going to use stainless. Most of those guys are going to use 420 stainless because you can harden it, okay? But, or 416 for the beauty side of it, you know? Uh, but most of these folders nowadays have got titanium in them. And then, uh, you know, micarta. Will, and G10 will just flat eat up any drilling tools also. But those will work great for countersinking your holes, okay? A tooling plate is exactly what it is. I use this on every knife, okay? If I gotta, if I gotta mill out I'll, uh, a, a relief on that lock bar, I'll tape it down, I'll get a big ball mill, I'll use a 3 ace ball mill, and I'll run that back and forth. I may go in this way, depends on what I'm doing. Okay, I can also clamp it in my vise like that, and I'll have my part, if I'm cutting a lock, I'll take, and that, say this is my oddly shaped liner, and if I gotta cut a lock there, I'll just clamp it in my vise like that, and I can go right across that way. If I gotta cut my long lock, I'll stick it just above again, I'll clamp it in my vise like that, and I can cut right along there, no chatter, no monkey business, nothing, okay? I use a, uh, a Moore's red cutoff wheel in a Dremel bit. They're 25,000. You can get 100 of them on eBay for 15 bucks. And they last forever. I've gone in those, and not Dremel. I don't like Dremel. Dremel breaks. Okay? Uh, and that's the, the composite Dremel shatters. These will shatter too, but they seem to last forever. I've gotten as many as two lock bars fully cut out of one disc. And I run them as fast as my big mill will run, which is around 2,000. And you just slow. You just let it cut. Just go across. And to get a nice 25,000 slit. Now, Dremel sells those too. You just got to go a little slower and be careful. I think Les uses those all the time, right? So um, that's just a preference, but they work pretty good. Okay. So now you got a stop pin or you're using standoffs. Most guys will put a space bar in the back of their folder because it's easier. I love space bar versus standoff. Standoffs are a pain in the ass. But, you know, it's a look and some guys like them. It's what you do. Now you want to get them to the exact length. Maybe your stop pin is a hidden stop pin and it's inside and you got to get to exact length. Your pivot has to get to exact length. So when you're clamping it down, it's not sitting proud of your liners. Or you're, and, and you can't tighten it up. Every screw, uh, there's no thread relief on 256 screws, so you can only screw it in so far, and it won't go flush to your pivot head, right? It's just how it is. 
so you got no thread relief so your your pivot has to actually be slightly smaller than your whole liner bearing or washer blade stack so you add up all the depths and, and there's math in folders unfortunately it's just add and subtract it's no big deal uh, but your pivot needs to be 50 thou less than your whole stack that way you get enough room to tighten and it still is going to stick in where it needs to stick to get that square and flat this is called a pivot lap now i copied these from a guy named bill vining and bill and i were friends a long time ago and he was pretty big into folders and he actually came up and that's where i saw the idea and i said can i make them he said sure so i started making these and i use these in just about every folder and what they are is just a flat piece of hardened steel and they have different bushings that fit in here okay so there's a bushing like that and they come with a plunger and each of these bushings holds a certain diameter so when you want to get your stop pin to length instead of clamping it in your in your pliers and trying to touch it on the grinder right and it's crooked and it's and it's heat colored and all of that and it's nasty um, this will do the job so what you're going to do is you're going to take put the right size bushing in and so this looks like an eighth you're going to drop that in there and you're going to get a surface plate and if you don't have a surface plate you want one if you don't if you can't afford a surface, you go to a, literally go to a grave place one of the memorial where you can buy they'll sell you a piece of of flat now a, a surface plate is cheap they're like 40 bucks the biggest part of surface plate is paying shipping and they are yep i make monuments they're not all flat well be careful about that. yeah <laughs> that's true but for what we're doing if you get a thou across the length of it you're going to be fine they're not awfully it's a that's a fair point check that yep yeah but you want so you want a flat surface to check your work on you get a piece of steel in you're going to take it and you're going to spin it and then you're going to flip it around and you're going to spin it and then you're going to see if it's flat or not if it spins on one side it's crooked pretty hard to figure out so you're going to take that you're going to put some 400 grit on your surface plate you're going to just take push that little bushing in there and you're going to scrub it around you're going to pop it out and you're going to measure it and you're just going to repeat that until you dial in now if i got a lot to take off and buy a lot 20 thou 30 thou I'll use a 120 grit and I'll scrub the hell out of it. And then I'll get closer and when I get within a couple thou of where I want to be, I'll switch to a 400 or a 600 grit. And then I'll get it close and then I'll flip it over and I'll touch the other side so I have two square ends. Okay? And I can get, I promise you, I can get that to within two to three tenths of a thou of a target length. And that way you're going to be right where you want to be. Okay? Cheap tool. Uh, and it'll last you forever, different sizes that way, okay? So, when you got screws that are too long, you're always cutting screws, you're trying to figure out how to get screws down to size. Alan Elizowitz sells these every now and then. He makes a run, he posts it, they sell out in a couple weeks. They're like 60 or 65 bucks, I don't know what they're going for now. And he's got several different size screws holes in here. You screw that in, squeeze it, and it chops the screw right off. Now, you can make your own screw chopper, but you can't make one as cool as this. <laughs> Just the way it is. Okay, so if you don't want a screw chopper, what you're going to do is you're going to take any kind of metal, the thick, different ones, and you're going you're gonna to drill and tap holes in, this, in these plates, and you're just going to run it against a disc grinder and do that. The problem is... When you're doing this and you run it against your grinder, your screws start to back out, so you put your thumb there, okay? And you know how hot those screws get? You'll find out, okay? And that's just how it works. So you can get different sizes of these plates, and I just, this is just some scrap tie that I had, and I'll have, I've probably got four or five different thicknesses, but these things are nice, okay? If you got to nip off just one, one thread or something, it's quick, boom, done like that okay now we talked a little bit uh, earlier about carbonizers in one of the sessions this is a carbonizer and no one's giving these away they're like I don't know 400 bucks you can make your own for whatever you can make it okay and what what this does is this has tungsten carbide and it creates a plasma arc uh, onto the metal and so uh, with the polarity correct you're depositing metal from this tungsten carbide onto 
the lock face of your titanium uh, folder. And the deal is titanium is generally soft. And titanium against, hardened, uh, against soft steel, especially galls, and it sticks. Hardened steel, a little bit less so. But carbidizing will, will deposit about a 72 RC hardness layer of material on that lock face. So it's around 72. And, and it starts to, you're going to get about a thou or two in thickness. Uh, it used to be when these hit the scene, everyone says, oh, I can save my lock. You can't save a lock. Just, you know, guys were saying, oh, car, you know, I went too far. I carbidized it. It came right in. That doesn't work. That's not true. You can't save a lock that's over ground. <clears throat> the carbidized surface on that lock bar and that titanium lock bar is now hardened and acts and is as almost, well, it's quite a bit harder actually than your blade steel. And, and titanium wears. Just by just that little action, it's going to wear. But that carbidized face is going gonna, is gonna to really slow down and it's going to help with the impact as you flick open a knife, right? As you, there's a lot of stress in that right there okay and so that carbonized lock face number one helps with sticky locks it, it makes that uh, a lot smoother and you'll get a lot more life out of your lock face now when you carbon when you carbonize your lock and you go to do it you're gonna go well that doesn't feel good and what you're gonna do is you're gonna have to put some you're gonna put some pressure on your blade and you're gonna slide it off you're gonna put some pressure on the blade and you're gonna slide it off you're going to wear off just a little bit of those high spots. So you do got to break in that lock face between the carbidized lock face and your blade tank. Okay, so you're going to be sitting there doing this for a while. Break it in and, and knock off those real high spots because it deposits very unevenly. So this is it's awesome to do. This is just a Dremel. So... Some guy in Florida in his garage makes these for us. I've opened the insides up. It, it, it's, it's hideous. It's the worst soldering I've ever seen. <laughs> <coughs> so there's a plasma arc there, and it's depositing carbide wherever that's going. And so you're going to do that on your lock face. Now you do it on the edge on a sharp corner, you get a better plasma arc. But it deposits tungsten carbide. Now, Warren Osborne, uh, God rest his soul, used to make titanium blades for the EOD guys. Navy divers wanted non-ferrous non blades. And, and uh, so he would make a titanium blade, and he would carbidize one side of the edge. He'd sharpen it, and then he would carbidize one side of the edge. The other side he did not carbidize. So as you used it, the steel side would wear away, exposing new sharp edge on the carbidized side and you would have this kind of sawtooth kind of very aggressive cutting kind of uh, blade and man he sold a boatload of those things and so if you ever you'll see some of them kicking around and you'll see some guys going around it's fun to do I did one and man it's a cardboard cutting machine but you know you don't want to butter your toast with it it's just not the way to go so that's a couple things on tools um, you're welcome to take a look at the surface grinder we put together over here. Uh, that cost about 300 bucks. Wasn't hard to make. The hardest part was just matching up the tools. I'd look for years to find another surface grinder. I've got a stone one. I don't want to convert that to a belt. I know that's that. I just didn't want to convert it. Stones work better. That's all there is to it. And I'll defy anyone to say different. Um, and I was looking for a used surface grinder to convert to a belt. Well, then these SGA things came out. And I looked at blade forms, and then another guy on Knife Dogs made one. And I kind of looked at his stuff, and I ordered a few parts from AliExpress. The, the compound slide on there, they call it a Z-axis. The Chinese make up all kinds of names. About 120 bucks. The linear actuator rail uh, on there that's part of it, I think that was like 45 bucks. AliExpress, you get it in two, three weeks. Okay. And the parts list, I put parts numbers and all that on Knife Dogs on a forum there so you can see just go search for surface grinder attachment and you'll you'll see that the I used aluminum because I got aluminum out my butt here and that was just easy to use you mill channels in we put some neodymium <laughs> say that fast magnets and we just used epoxy to put them in the heat you know we'll see everyone well what about the heat well there's heat yeah you know slow down and you just drag it across 
and uh, it is awesome. It, it, you, that blade's not coming off of there. That, I'm wearing this because it nicked me yesterday. It's getting on there and clamp. Just took a big chunk out of my finger. Just the way it is. But that, I would recommend that you take a look at one of those things, especially if you're doing any kind of Damascus or you got uh, steel with a lot of mill scale on it and you want to get that mill scale off, those things are awesome. I, I did a couple test bars. I took some 01 precision ground measured it within, within a half across eight inches. I ran it several times. I took about 25 thou off of that bar by just stroking it on that surface grinder and I kept within one thou tolerance across that six to eight inch piece. That's amazing. One thou, I can barely hold a half on my, on my stone surface grinder. So it's, a, it's really a cool deal, okay, that way. If you want, we'll take a look. How's that temperature? Where are we at? Five. We're close. Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, salt, bluing salts a little bit. We're heating up a niter blue, niter blue, N-I-T-R-E, niter blue, bluing salts. At room temperature, they're solid. You get those from brownells.com. I've got a folder over on the table over there that's, uh, I, I, it's got patchwork, and you'll see all the different colors, all of Peter Martin's knives, if you've ever seen his. Um, there he does he niter blues all those every color every alloy steel that you put in there will come out with a different color okay and so that's where you see in those those knives with blues and purples and and all those different colors okay so when you're making a can of Damascus and it's not going to be a cutting edge you can put mild steel in there you can put you can put whatever you want in that can and the more that you put in you get that folder <clears throat> Les has got one here on his folder. He made some bubble, and uh, he can show you that. Look at the stunning color on that. Now it's it it wears away. It's gonna wear. Okay, these are for pretty knives. Okay, you can make a user and brag about how you're just a user guy all day, but you damn well better learn how to make a pretty knife occasionally. Okay, so that that stuff. Uh, you heat it to around 575, okay? And then you're going to dip your, your uh, blade in there or your bolster or your Damascus, and it's going to be in there for 30 seconds to two minutes. And we'll dip some here in just a minute when we get the temperature, okay? So when you're dipping a blade, it's already been heat treated, ground and everything, and the first question is, what does that do to your temper, right? So if you've got a 60 RC blade, and you dip your blade in a 575 degree solution for a minute and a half, what happens to your temper? Almost nothing. Temper is a function of time just like it is a function of temperature. Okay? So no one's been able to measure it. No one's told me they've measured it. I'm kind of comfortable in that thought process that you're only in there for 30, 45 seconds and it may in fact soften your blade slightly it may so then leave it hard to begin with uh, I've talked I've seen other guys that will uh, will quench their blade fully hard then they'll go do their bluing then they'll temper after whether they get out of that I don't know they feel more comfortable I'll, I'll quench temper dip it okay so that's one type of bluing salt it's a fragile surface but it's gorgeous it's drop dead and you put different colors in your Damascus, it will color differently. Okay, now there's another one, Carl Anderson, most of you know him. Carl uses something called oxinate black. And that's where you, uh, where you have water and you pour salt in that water under high temperature. And as you add salt, the boiling point raises. The more salt you put in, the higher the boiling point. Your target is around 290 degrees is what, what Carl uses for his. It's actually 292 in the documentation. So you keep adding these salts until the temperature stabilizes at 292 degrees, and then you boil it for about 20 minutes in that solution. As you're boiling, some of the water will boil off. You may have to add a little water. Now keep in mind, you're putting water into something that's 290 degrees. Yeah. Ice cube. Ice cube. Perfect. Perfect. Right. Okay. 
And so you're going to eat, you'll, so you manage the temperature not with your, your flame controller or your burner control. You manage it with the amount of salt that you put in. I have oxinate 7. Oxinate 7 is different than black. Black just produces black. Oxinate 7 will give you the same color, the same temperature colors that niter blue will give you, except the surface finish is more durable. Okay? It does, it takes a little bit more finesse, I think, with the oxinate 7 to get what you want. And so you got to boil it in there for 20 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever that may be, but you'll get pretty much the same colors, okay, uh, with a more durable finish, but I think most guys are using niter blue because it's fast, it's easy, it's done, right? So we've got to, where are we at? Okay, I've got, let me step over here, please. Now this is thicker than normal, and part of this is a function of temperature. Starting to take on a blue, so this has got oil on it, I think. If this was thinner, this would be done. Let's pretend this worked, okay? <laughs> so if I pull this out, it's now blue. As I'm gonna, everybody. Yeah. 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 That's nice, that's nice. So as you're gonna dip your blade or your bolster or whatever material, you're gonna put it in you're going to check it. You're going to put it in. You can actually see in there, and you can kind of see the colors come. If you go too far, you got to sand it off. Okay? So you're going to dip it in. You're going to check it. You're going to dip it in. Now, some guys claim that they've got that stopwatch, and they do this and that. I just look. Okay? So you get there. You look. You do that. Okay? Too far, it turns into, uh, it will go, the color uh, progression on some of these is that actually did take on a little bit of color. Um, we're going to turn that off. This is hot. Don't touch it. Um, so, so the color progression is like a, a forge. You know, you've all seen the, the flame colors, and it, and it progresses. It does the same thing there. So you can follow that chart, and you, know, you can't look at it and say, well, I want this. You've got to just keep looking. You dunk in, you check. You dunk in, and you check. And that's, that's what you do. Now, if you do it enough, you're going to have it dialed in. Is, uh Oh, huge, huge. I, and I just grabbed it, and that's why I said I had oil on I could tell as soon as I dunked it in, I should have cleaned the oil off. Yep. Is this only on carbon steel, or does this also work on stainless? Carbon I haven't done uh, carbon. Is to, carbon. It, 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 the chrome will affect it, and it, so if it's got more chrome in, you'll take less color. I've never done a stainless. I don't know anyone that does. Brownells will try and sell you a cleaner, and I didn't buy it. I just use Windex. You know, Windex or isopropyl alcohol, and that, that cleans it off pretty good as far as that goes, you know. Yep. Does getting oil in the bath pollute the bath? Like, now that there's oil in there, do you have a way of cleaning that, or do you just not? I, 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 it shouldn't be a problem. And it stuff's cheap. God, you get a big pail of it. I mean, that stuff is not that expensive. So it, it, it's... It's just not that much. Now, if you put copper in, you'll kill the you'll kill the bath just like that. Anything with copper in, you'll kill your salt bath. So keep copper out, okay? And if you've got a pan that's coated and then basically copper underneath, avoid that. This is just I don't know if that's stainless or not. And then for this oxinate, we just use mild and made a tank. Yep. Is there any concern about deposits left on the blade? Yeah, you clean them off good. It, it will rust. It, it will continue to sit there and rust and, and that. Now you can use baking soda to neutralize. I just use Windex. Again, Windex rocks. It, it just neutralizes it, takes care of it. You know, but you don't want to leave the salts on there. Let it cool off and get the salts off right away. Because when you pull it out and set it to the side and it starts to cool off, the salts will congeal in, in the case of the niter stuff. Now the, the oxy, that's liquid at room temperature. But it, it will sit there and it will spot. So as soon as it's cool enough, you want to get it off. Now, when I'm doing this in this, I'll have water right here. I'll go here and I'll dip there because I'm concerned about temper. Get after your etch if you do Damascus in there. You etch it. Then you, you won't etch. Uh, you won't etch. That that's in place of the etch. 
Okay, now if you want texture, you know, you go for a real deep texture, which I don't know why you would, but some people do. Um, then you put that in there, but you, you don't etch after it. That's that's it. That's the color. Okay, and the more in the every alloy that you put in, I can't tell you the colors. Wish I could, and I got all of them laid out here, and I'm going to go through and I got more time and in, in that, and I'm going to check and figure out what each color. Now I can tell you that will progress, and if you leave it in there too long, it turns into uh, Les and I were talking a kind of a weird purple, ugly. It's not good. Not, yeah, all, all I've done is I've gone too far, yeah. and if you look at your type, like titanium colors stream, you go from bronze to purple, to navy blue to a little lighter blue, then you go really light blue, and then you start getting into kind of a yellow, and that's what it'll do if you stay in there too long. And no one wants it'll probably go further than that if you leave it in there way too long. Right. Then uh, also we were talking about how he had done some. Uh, bolsters that were not heat treated because why would you heat treat a bolster right put it in and it'll color and then uh, by accident he did some hardened ones and the color was much better and clearer I think he used the word foggy the, the ones that weren't heat treated were foggy right so you so you want to heat treat and then I mean it only makes sense uh, all that is, is is a reflection right it's a coating and you're just reflecting light differently and if you got a hardened steel versus a soft steel, the structure is different in hardened steel. We, everyone knows that it's different crystal and it's going to reflect light differently. So that's that's our guess on on why that comes out that way. Okay. What else? Is there, what is the finish? The so, fin. So to get to get to the level of finish that you're that one you showed. Right? Oil. So, so it comes out of there. You started out at a. Oh, oh, grit. Grit. 1,200. Started out at 1,200. The finer the finish, the better. Whatever it takes to get your mirror polished. You get yep. the best look from a mirror. Yeah, mirror. Okay. Otherwise, if you see any scratch marks in there, say you got a 600 finish and you yeah. still see lines, right? You can with the 600. They're, they're going to show up. In yeah, fact, yeah. They'll, show, they'll, be, uh, they'll show up more. Okay. So really a nice buff finish looks the best on that. Okay. Okay. What else? Okay, I got one last set of tools to show you. Excuse me. I had those made because I use them. I sell them. You can make one yourself. Okay, this is called a snap gauge. Like this. A caliper snap gauge. I use it all day long. Very handy. Digital caliper snap gauge. Very handy. This is a regular caliber. Caliper, star it, or Matutu would be good. Get a Harbor Freight if you can't if you can't get one of the other ones. It's it's for life. For life. And <laughs> Harbor Freight, you know, say what you will, but they've really made an effort to improve their tool quality. They got some absolute crap tools. Everyone knows that. But they got some gems. That saw that's right over there, I've had for 20 years. It lasts, you can't break the damn thing. I'm tired of it, I'm gonna get a new one just because I've had it so long. So when you're making folders, you're gonna to want to measure, but calipers, I know machine shops will not let a caliper in the, in the place. Calipers are one of the most inaccurate tools you can get. Unless you're running a lathe and you're measuring round parts, these suck. Okay, now having said that, I use them all the time. But these are not accurate. What's accurate is a micrometer. This is called an anvil stand. Okay, you can get that or not, or you can make your own. And again, Harbor Freight makes a decent digital micrometer. And this is what you want to use for knife making. Your target is one half of a thou on everything. That's your goal. A thou is a mile in folders. So get you a decent micrometer, okay, digital, and it needs to measure past one thou, point zero 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 one. So you want it to measure down to two tenths of a thou, and they're common as ticks on a dog, <laughs> and you can get them for thirty, forty bucks, decent one. Do not get the general tool one that's got this weird thing that spins around and maybe I've got three of them I threw away a long time ago but those aren't accurate at all what you want to do is you want to be able to measure to a half a thou first thing I do when I start on a folder is I measure all my parts 
I measure the liners in several places. I measure the blade thickness several places. I measure my pivots in two or three places. I measure the, the head diameters on screws in several places. So I know what all my measurements are and there's no surprises. There's nothing worse than maybe a screw got mixed up and you got a 163 hole and your screw head is 165 and what the hell, you know, and stuff like that. So one of the most, the best tool that you can get for accuracy or to improve your accuracy is gonna be a caliper and then this, these anvils, they just hold it in place. It sits right there on my bench and I'll just stick a part in and like that. Now most of these will have two different methods of, of tightening and there'll be one that's loose and there'll be one that's kind of got clicks. The click one, that's how you're supposed to use these. So when you tighten it up, you got a gross tightening thing and you'll kind of get it tight and then you go until it clicks. And that way you get an accurate reading every single time. Now, not all of these click. Uh, some of them will just spin. They'll only tighten so far and that way you get an accurate. So if I take the, the big one and I twist it, I can change that by three thou. Easy. Plus I'm hard on my caliper. Now some of these are backwards. Some of the, sometimes the big loose one here, I think on my lathe, the big one here is actually doesn't click, but it just spins. <coughs> and it, but it brings it to the same tightness every time and you, and you measure accurately every single time. Okay. Any questions on any of that stuff? That light, huh? This, this one's a my tutu. My tutu yo. However you say that, mid of YouTube. Some Jap thing. That's the best. That one measures down to to one tenth of one thou. They they rock. You can get okay. the mechanical ones cheap too. Yep. Digital, I I prefer a, I prefer an analog caliper. And and I know digital. I love digital. Everything. I got DROs all over the place. And I've had digital calipers. I prefer an analog caliper because it's fast. It's there. It's done. But you're in the battery. Don't die. I prefer a digital. A digital caliper. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Any other? Any questions on any of that? Do you sell the spring ones? Which ones? No, I did. I saw that on a YouTube video. I think Alan had one of the, Alan Lezowitz, I was watching one of his videos and he whips that thing out and I said, holy shit. And I stopped the video and I ordered one on the spot. Because <laughs> I didn't have one. <laughs> so any other questions on any of that stuff? Any questions on any of the tools? We can, now we're going to bring Les up. Lester. Oh, one other thing, take a sticker, support your second amendment, because after they get the damn guns, what are they coming for? Really you look at Great Britain, man, you cannot carry a knife. You know that, right? I used to have a lot of trade out of Great Britain. It dried up. It's dead. So support your second amendment, get a sticker, support your knife rights.